Thank you. So today I would like to speak about innovation in education um, and what I think uh, is going to really bring us to the next level in this area. Specifically, um, I would like to make a call for schools and universities, for teachers and professors to put all of their educational content online available for everyone, to free their educational materials. But before I get into details on this aspect, um, let me remind you of the challenges we face in higher education. So based on 2012 levels, the number of students worldwide is expected to double by 2025. And that is not something that the universities of the world are prepared for. The number of students that have to travel abroad in order to get a higher education because of capacity shortcuts is expected to triple in the same time frame. So when we look at the refugee crisis, we currently have about 60 million displaced people worldwide. And only 1% of young displaced people in this world have access to higher education. Think about that. They're people like you and I. They think about their future a lot. They want a better future. They sit in refugee homes and have a lot of time on their hand to think about their future. I mean, that's supposed to be a temporary state anyway, so they're wondering what's next. And yet, our societies usually don't manage to give them sufficient access to higher education. The UNHCR has identified four factors that are the reasons why, we have, why we're so bad at giving refugees access to higher education. That's cost for the refugees themselves. Universities around the world are usually quite expensive. Capacity shortages language issues, and most frustratingly, bureaucratic hurdles. They might not have the right documents. So at Chiron, this is the problem that we like to tackle, that we try to tackle. And we have identified online education as the most suitable means for that. Because the cost of any additional student um, is really low. So our students study for free, because the per student cost is low. The capacity is not really a problem because it's very scalable and there's no hard limit to how many people can study online. Our programs are in English, which is still the language that's most likely to be spoken by the refugees. And we don't require any of the documents that a traditional university expects their students, including the refugees, to have. So what does that look like? Our students uh, apply online. Uh, we don't ask for a lot. Um, again, uh, none of the usual documents. Um, and then they study online with us for two years. Uh, we have four study tracks, business, computer sciences, engineering, and social sciences. Um, they can pick from these. And after two years of studying online with us, they can transfer to a partner university, which then officially acknowledges and recognizes these online courses they took with us. Then our students finish their studies there uh, on campus and get an official bachelor degree from that partner university. So the interesting thing is the online courses that we provide, actually we don't produce them ourselves. There are people who can do that a lot better than we can. People from MIT, from Yale, from Harvard, right, who put their courses online for free on platforms such as edX and Coursera. What we then do is we take all of those small individual courses that are floating around the internet and we organize them into a curriculum, into modules that are based on each other, and a curriculum that makes sense both for our students and for the partner universities who will then take over the students to make sure it's matched with their curricula. <coughs> so what that might look like in reality, um, I would like to tell you by an example. So take our student Ibrahim. He arrived in Germany last fall after a long, arduous journey from Syria and he was put into a refugee home. He was not allowed to work. He was not allowed to study. Essentially, he was not allowed to do anything valuable with his time. He was forced to sit in this fairly miserable refugee home. So when he found out about Chiron, um, he was quite excited because this was a chance for him to do something with his time. He decided to study computer sciences. And now, according to his own schedule, what works for him he can go to his local library, log into our platform, he selects the courses that he wants to study that day, goes on these courses, and you know, he will see video lectures, read texts, take multiple choice quizzes, online studying. So 
when Ibrahim now comes to our events, he talks about his future in a very different way. He now talks about his future in a way that he's looking forward to it, right? You see his, his aspirations, his dreams coming back to life. And this, I think, is a really beautiful thing. So now I'd like to get back to my topic, because what we do at Chiron, we couldn't have done without people deciding to upload educational materials for free. But I think this is only in a nascent stage. This is only the beginning, and we need much more. So I like to think of educational content as really valuable seeds that can grow into knowledge plants, right? And they're distributed all over the world in little treasure chests. The thing is, these chests are locked. Currently, most educational content is not freely available. They're locked in all of the millions of treasure chests, right? And that used to make a lot of sense because it used to be difficult to get it out of these treasure chests. We had to print content into books, right, and distribute them. That was expensive. We had to distribute them with video cassettes. That was expensive too. But things have changed. We now have the internet. It has become incredibly cheap and incredibly easy to put all of this content available at the hands of everybody else. So this is really what I would like you to think about. Um, and it's, it's as easy as you know, uploading content that is already digital onto Google Drive, onto Dropbox. There's not a specific platform I want to recommend. What matters is that it's out there. And the second thing that really matters is that the content is equipped with the right license. It's not enough that people can just watch the content for free. They need to be able to redistribute it, to do all sorts of things with it. Uh, and this has been made really easy with a Creative Commons project, which creates all sorts of licenses that you can simply copy-paste. And what I recommend is the attribution share alike license. It's a traditional copy-left license, a classic copy-left license, as opposed to copyright, right? Attri attribution share alike means uh, there's only two things that you really have to do. You have to attribute the content to the right author, and you have to share it under the same license. So while you can do commercial things with it, you cannot actually sell the content that you got for free under that license, which makes sense. One really important thing that you can do with that license is you can remix the content. And what that means is you can take a small part from a lecture, a small part that makes sense for your program or that makes sense for your student, extract it. Maybe take a small part from some other text, right? Another part from another thing. And then you can recombine that into new study programs, into new courses that make sense for your context and your setting. This is the thing, right? Once we open up the treasure chest, there's like a wind that can pick up the educational seeds and that can carry them to fertile soil where they grow into knowledge trees and where they can really start to unfold in people's minds. The thing is, we don't know where that fertile soil is, right? We can only put the seeds up into the air and then be like, grow where you will grow. And that's why we need an unrestricted license, right? If we could imagine exactly who is going to use our educational content for what, it might make sense to draft a specific license. But we're in a situation where we have no idea where this is going to go. So those professors from MIT and Yale, they had no idea that one day their courses would be used by some guys in Berlin to help in the refugee crisis, right? And they made that possible by being like, use it, use it, it's yours. And this is what I want to achieve. So once we've reached a critical mass of this freely available content, educational content online, and I think we're talking 3%, maybe 4 or 5% of professors or institutions that rigorously upload their content under these liberal licenses, I think we're going to see a lot of different innovations in the educational area. Um, so for example, the way free courses uh, that are online are created right now is quite centralized. So you might have one professor and his team um, who create all of the content, right? They record the lectures, they write the text, they write the tests, um, and then they upload that onto edX or Coursera usually. I think what is going to happen in the future when we have this abundance of content, that we're going to see small communities of content creators and editors who come together and they mix and match the content that's online uh, in a way that makes sense for them. So they might take some online lectures from MIT, maybe add some texts, maybe from this university of Minossi. Maybe they'll take an interactive learning game from the Technical University of Munich, a multiple choice quiz from the University of Hong Kong, 
And then they'll add maybe some algorithm uh, like for peer grading um, that some developer put online and add that to it. And this then is a new package, a new course, right, that makes sense specifically for their purpose, for their institution, for their students, and that's created in a wholly different way. Then secondly, I think there's going to be a range of small innovations in the education sector that we're going to be enabling um, by doing this. And I hope to be part of this innovation, actually. I think we're going to see a lot more platforms um, that are designed for sharing educational content. Um, so far, there's actually not much, uh, not much out there. Um, and you know, for our purposes for now, it's enough to, to make it available. But once enough is available, these platforms are going to help us organize, curate this content, while letting people study it. And letting people study the content on the same platform where it's hosted allows for something very special to happen. It allows for user-generated input to help us understand the educational content and its values and its characteristics much better. Right? So while students study these things, they can tag it. Right? Um, we can match it with their learners' profiles to see what student is it suitable for, and things like that. Um, once we have an abundance of digital content, we can apply innovations that we use in other sectors since many, many years, right? And where it's really about time that we apply it to the educational sector. So we can start with simple things such as A-B testing, right? A-B testing is used in marketing. When you have two materials that have essentially the same content, you see which one actually does better, usually at selling something, right? But so if you have two lectures that essentially have the same content, you can automatically assess which one teaches the students the material in a better way. Now, this is only the beginning. From A-B testing, you can really go to big data. You can go to machine learning algorithms that both create profiles for the educational content and that create learner profiles. And in learner profiles, I'm not only interested in the, you know, the classic promise of digital education, being that we know very specifically what kind of knowledge the student has and what areas, but also how the student learns, right? Does she learn by seeing, by reading, by hearing? Everybody learns differently, and we can match that to the right content when we apply the profiles to them. Finally, I think we're going to see a lot more innovation in the area of student interaction and students teaching students. So in the hierarchy of what helps us uh, understand and internalize material best, what's actually at the very top is teaching other people, right? After you learn something and you teach somebody else that material, and I'm sure many of you have experienced that, you internalize it in a much better way. And we can use that in online education, where we want students interacting with each other much more anyway, um, to create small classes, small student tutoring projects, right? That really add the interactive element to these online classes. So freeing the seeds of education can do all sorts of things. It might help a single mom prepare for the job market. It could help a Kenyan farmer learn how to better sell his crops or make sense of East African politics. Or it can help us at Chiron help ed refugees get a, get a degree and integrate them into the job market. So once you set free the seeds of education, you don't know where they're going to land. You don't know where they're going to grow into knowledge trees. All we know is that they will grow because there's so much fertile soil out there. So I ask you to join me in this call to ask the educational institutions worldwide to free up their educational content because there's nothing to lose and there's so, so much to gain. Thank you.